any CEO that gets the opportunity to talk about his company and why they're the greatest is going to jump at that opportunity, right? So of course, uh, wanted wanted to come here and, and talk about the great things we're doing. I also have a lot of deep ties to the University of Utah that go back uh, quite quite a far away. So this really is just uh, uh, a great opportunity for me, and um, look forward to sharing um, our journey and how we got to where we are now. So um, here, here's uh, as Ar said, uh, what what we'd be speaking on, and um, the 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 key thing that I I hope I can accomplish today is to discuss how you can take sustainable um, initiatives and commercialize them and turn it into a large and, uh, and a, a vast reaching business. And Aquield, we're, we're barely hitting the tip of the iceberg as far as what we can do. And um, I, I'm gonna talk about some things that maybe uh, some media, I, I can't typically talk about with the media, which is talking about the big conglomerates that we're competing with and how they don't want us to succeed um, and how um, you know we'll go through some of the guerrilla tactics that we're involved in that are making us uh, have some great headway into the agricultural supply chain. Um, fertilizer, um, just briefly, the fertilizer supply chain is a $180 billion uh, dollar industry. So it is, it is massive um, and it's rather archaic. Um, it's uh, a lot of the ways that we've been fertilizing our crops have not significantly changed since after World War II. And so there's just tremendous opportunity um, in this space. And um, you know, you, you want to be involved in something that you're passionate about and you love. And I literally get to jump out of bed every day knowing um, I'm making a great effect to the world and have, uh, have a fun vision there. So, so um, this is a great tie-in with what's being accomplished here um, from these great gentlemen. Um, nanotechnology is already a big part of um, what uh, the, your, your group is doing. Um, when we see what Krista Carlson is doing and um, what I believe she's doing with carbon nanotubes to purify water is just tre tremendous. Um, I, I love seeing um, the ways that you can actually commercialize nanotechnology because it is just so far reaching with the opportunities of what you can do. Hello, hello, please join. Um, and so, uh, the, you know, I, I wasn't as aware of what's uh, being accomplished here um, in, with the Water Center until just recently. and. Um, hope that afterwards we can have some great collaborations and opportunities. Um, Aquield, our company, we invest about 25% of our revenues directly to research development. And that's a very important for us because um, being able to continue to develop great technologies and products is how you, became, you, you know, become something that's going to be continued to be used by your end customers. Um, of course, uh, my, my general counsel Made, made sure that um, this is copyrighted material that we're going through. Um, we are an up and coming startup and there's some things that um, you know, we, we need to make sure that are copyrighted. And I've d tried to do the best I can as, uh, as far as you know, noting some of the sources of the information that we'll be sharing. So um, quickly, um, as Art discussed, um, we have partnered with the Ant Nano Institute of Utah, um, which is the um, co-director uh, by Hamid Gandahari, um, who's just a brilliant and exceptional human being that we love working with. Um, uh, briefly, what we've done um, is we had a base nanoparticle that had some limited capabilities that we've had a pretty, uh, pretty great success with. Um, I stumbled into a meeting with uh, one, of our, one of our generous uh, individuals here, Kyle Isaacson, um, he was uh, finishing up his PhD um, in the bioengineering group and um, another individual from that group. And we basically sat down at lunch at the Huntsman Cafe and talked about the limitations of our nanotechnology, um, which we thought was just the greatest thing ever. And uh, Kyle made us aware that there were such greater um, you know, nanotechnologies that could be delivered. And essentially what we're doing is a lot of these nanoparticles that are being developed for uh, drug um, chemistry and uh, delivery, um, some of them don't get to be what we call grass, generally recognized as safe, can't be used for human consumption. And so there's a huge opportunity for us to take a lot of these uh, particles and, com and compounds and to put them into agric agricultural chemi chemistry delivery or to fertilizer delivery. And uh, of course, I'll, I'll showcase where those opportunities are. Um, if you want to learn more about our partnership, of course, you can uh, visit this article also on our YouTube channel. Um, we have some great 
um, and exceptional things that are being said by Dr. Gondahari about uh, our collaboration. Um, essentially, our collaboration turned to, into us uh, selecting some of the different nanoparticles that were available, and we uh, found one that we found what could be uh, put into our IP portfolio and through the Technology and Venture Commercialization Office and through the Nano Institute and of course by uh, the mothership, the University of Utah, we now have a product that's going to be released um, and make one of our, our, our second most popular product which we call NanoRise and it will be put into that, uh, into that product uh, towards the end of um, this month. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, one of the main things that's super exciting about it is the most used chemical um, in all farming is nitrogen. And we have now uh, developed a product that can really help with nitrogen uptake and less waste. The Technology Venture Commercialization um, does, a, does a great report where they showcase technologies that they've invested into that are now actually being commercialized. Because um, as it stands, typically we come up with a lot of great ideas from academia. But when you uh, taking that idea into actually making a minimal viable product can be rather, rather tough. One, um, you have to be able to fund it. Um, for us to develop this nanoparticle, it cost, uh, it cost Aquild uh, just under a quarter million dollars. Um, and that is without us going through all the labor and staffing, um, just the, the hard cost there. Um, and so most businesses being able to uh, be able to make that kind of investment can make it hard. And then secondly, um, as, as I'm sure many of you that are involved in research and development is there's a lot of iterations and there's a lot of assays and there's a lot of uh, field trials that need to take place before you can actually put it into, um, into a, a potential customer's hands. Um, and we were able to do that in a pretty rapid scale. Uh, typically, a fertilizer for it to come to market, it's about a five-year uh, period of time. Um, Aqua Yield, we've we figured it out that we can pretty much get everything out within 18 to 24 months. Um, we're very agile, and we have great collaborations, and um, that kind of gives us a leg up in comparison to some of the others. Um, the, um, when it comes to fertilizer, um, fertilizer is a bit of the wild, wild west still. Um, it, it, there's issues with um, EPA and how you develop agro, ag agrochemistry, such as you know, things like we know, dicamba, 2,4-D, glyphosate, um, which after they um, weren't as thoughtful about them, we've had ramifications. Um, for instance, uh, Monsanto and Bayer uh, just uh, had a class action lawsuit awarded to an individual for $80 million for using glyphosate, um, and they, they knew um, about the carcinogens that were in that chemistry. Um, and so I believe in the coming future, in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see a lot of the stricter standardizations with registering fertilizers um, so that we can have um, you know, a, a better and brighter future um, with the things that we're putting in our crops. And greatly for us in Aqua Yield is we're perfectly suited for what's to come. Um, typically to commercialize an agricultural chemistry, it's about, about seven years. Um, and so that, that also can be a hurdle um, because it, it takes very deep pockets and a lot of trials and assays to develop this. Um, but going back, uh, the TVC um, featured Aquield, and I, I think that's uh, essentially how we came here together. So great to, great to know. So I, I have a unique background um, that has brought me to where I am today. Um, briefly, uh, my background is how I became an ag biotech entrepreneur has been, I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up in Mill Creek, Utah. But on the weekends, my dad would take me to our farm, and he would literally put me out on a, on a dirt road in front of a big field, and uh, we would have a bunch of um, a pipe that we'd use to irrigate our crops. And I would, um, from the morning till lunch, I'd be responsible for moving that pipe about three feet. And I started doing that from the time I was eight years old until I could uh, essentially start delivering uh, sod. Uh, my family owns a sod farm called Biograss. Um, I've been involved in farming for over 20 years. Um, even though I'm 35, I have officially been an employee in agriculture since I was 15. Um, so I even though I'm, I'm younger in my career, I've been involved in farming and crop production for some time. Um, I've exited some other enterprises that I've been involved in, uh, started and sold other companies. Um, and that's what uh, you know, helped me understand this space and how to you know, get a startup to where it's at, such as Aqua Yield. Um, I'm really passionate about regenerative agriculture, uh, soil health, and sustainability. These are the key components uh, for the farming industry to continue to thrive and do well, is we need to understand better 
um, how we're treating our soils. And we can't pound them with as much fertilizer as we've done in the past because we're seeing a lot of issues with us thinking about maximizations of yield. Um, there are some detriments to that in the near future. And so some of those keywords, soil health, regenerative ag, these are a lot of uh, buzzwords in the industry right now. But they're, they're really important for us to understand how we can continue to thrive and, and grow our crops. And then uh, lastly, my family, uh, the Bell family, um, from Willard Dwayne Bell, who's my great, great, great grandpa, um, we literally mined ore in Idaho Falls. So that was fertilizer. And we've been growing crops since the 1830s. Um, we, we've only gone bankrupt twice in that period of time as farmers. So that's a pretty good job, uh, j just so you know. Um, luckily, we got involved in high-end crops. Uh, we grow turf grass for lawns. And that's, our, that's uh, the business that we are involved in now. And where we essentially uh, discovered nanotechnology and agriculture at our family farm biograss. So that's my unique background and how I got involved in this. Additionally, uh, to things I'm involved in, um, Aukwield, we um, have some great accolades that we're really, really proud of. Yesterday, um, the University of Utah's uh, CPDC, the Career and Professional Development Center, awarded us as the Employer of the Year, which was just fantastic. Um, you know, awards about growth and about, thank you, thank, thank you. Um, this, of course, came from, uh, who's with us, uh, Kyle Isaacson, who nominated us and gave us just an awesome speech. Kyle, thank you so much, and you've been so great, uh, gr great to work with. Um, but, you know, these, these awards on innovation and growth and, and things of that nature, that's great. But when to be recognized by the people that you employ and the families that you help actually uh, promote you, that's, that's hands down um, what, what I'm here to do. Um, we're in the midst of uh, hiring a new um, uh, person that's going to you know, steamroll our, our HR because we're in a lot of growth and hiring a lot of people. And as a startup, you know, we're doing some of the same things we did five years ago compared to now. And it's not, frankly, it's not working. We need to get somebody that's really uh, understanding. And he asked me, what, what's my primary goal um, with the employees of Aukwield? And I, and I said, I want Aukwield to be a place that for a lot of our, our newer employees or ending employees that they'll look at this being the best place that they ever worked with the best culture and the best memories that they could have. And you know, even though I really want to affect the world with uh, sustainable agriculture with nanotechnology, um, more so I want to impact the employees that work for us. And um, you know, that gets me excited about what I'm doing. Um, lastly, Aukwield, we've been featured in a number of different places about the impact environmentally that we're making and our unique technology. Um, places such as Inc., Forbes, even down to local media like the um, Salt Lake Tribune and uh, Deseret News. And so uh, these are great opportunities for us. Doug, who's our Director of Communications, is filming now. Um, he does a tremendous job with uh, sharing our message. And it's really fun to see um, uh, the opportunities with this. Um, one thing that I've discovered um, in this journey is the, the big conglomerates and the oligarchs that are running a lot of this fertilizer supply chain they, they don't want us to cut fertilizer uh, amounts down. And so that's one of the biggest obstacles we have as we continue to grow and develop um, is finding out how we can uh, be symbiotic and, and have something that really works well for the farmer and also helps that big part of the supply chain with these billion dollar companies catch the idea of companies like us with sustainable agricultural inputs that, hey, if you, if you do this hand in hand with what you're doing, it's gonna be greater for our future. But that can be tough with a lot of these public companies and uh, massive billion dollar companies where for them it's all about the bottom line and they still want people to put out 45 gallons of 1034O um, orthophosphate fertilizer on a crop when in reality they could put something down like with nanofoss and only have to put 15 gallons down. So these are some of the uh, issues that we face and I'll discuss. Um, this is our team. Uh, it's, it, it's actually bigger than that now. What I'd like to point out that's interesting about our team is you'll see that we have a, a, a number of really young and up-and-coming scientists and agronomists. And since the change in commercialization of agriculture, we have a number of uh, seasoned agronomists that are in their 50s or 60s. So we have a really interesting team where we have a lot of budding uh, people in their career in their late 20s, early 30s that want to impact the world. And a lot of these seasoned regional managers and agronomists that have been working on crops for 40 years, and they really are tired of the way that has been done. And somehow they uh, got connected with Aukwield, and they're 
having major effects in their, um, in their uh, areas of uh, uh, specificity. So it's pretty exciting. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of talk about here's the problem. Um, with any pitch, when you tell people what, what you're doing, it's problem, solution, problem, solution. And so that's kind of how I'm starting out. And then we'll go into showcasing some of the research and uh, great wins that we've had in commercialization. Um, our chief science officer, um, he's, he's an awesome guy, brilliant individual, Dr. Landon Bunnerson. What we always like to tell people is, of course, we're going to show you our greatest research and, and, and wins, and uh, don't worry about the other 90%. That didn't work. And um, I think everyone can recognize in science that's a, that's a reality. And we're, we're really lucky where we actually probably do better than that if people actually apply it correctly. Um, this was an article that was uh, the, by uh, the USDA, by the National Institute of Food and Drug um, Administration. And essentially what the article states is, we are in, in the midst of the nutrient challenge of sustainable fertilizer management, okay? And our global population, so all of us, us um, being the species of humans, we are gonna have 9.7 billion people on this earth by the year 2050. So um, that's, that's pretty darn close, guys. That's 30 years from now. And what we have to do is we have to essentially triple our production of crops on the, on the land that we have available to us with the resources um, in order to, to feed this growing population. And um, what we call that in the agricultural industry is the race to 2050. And everyone is basically in the sustainable agricultural input game is looking at this race to 2050 of how we can feed all these mouths and do it with limited resources such as water such as phosphorus that comes from the earth because these are key components of growing crops and so that's essentially what we're uh, involved in um, what's happening with um, when we're not sustainably fertilizing our crops is we're seeing things like harmful algal blooms or algal blooms depends on where i'm at the country of how i should say that so i always say it both ways if i'm in michigan or florida or you know washington i have to say it different ways so uh, i think in utah we say algal blooms but I, I honestly can't, rem can't remember because of the national travel. Um, but algal blooms can be toxic. toxic. What happens is it makes it so that people and pets can't recreate uh, on the specific uh, water or consume uh, that water. And this is a great, um, this is a great storyboard and in, uh, in, um, description um, by the uh, EPA, by the Environmental Protection Agency, that talks about how 50 out of the 50 states have showcased nutrient um, deficiencies and how that's affected their watersheds. Um, here locally, that is not a photoshopped image, that is not a comic book, that is literally Utah Lake, which is what, 20 miles from where we stand right now? Um, Utah Lake is a place where I learned to water ski and I recreated with my family on a water ski boat uh, for a lot of my youth. Um, I haven't been able to actually take a motor boat on, on Utah Lake for I think we're now four years. Um, so this, this issue of algal bloom, which a key component of that is fertilizer runoff from people over fertilizing their lawns or farmers putting down too much fertilizer or being recommended by a crop consultant to put down too much fertilizer, we're now seeing those issues. And of course, this being the water center, you guys understand why, how important that is for us because we, uh, I, I personally depend on Utah Lake to irrigate my lawn in my garden. Um, I live in South Jordan, and I uh, pull my water from the, the Jordan Canal, um, which of course comes from Utah Lake. And so it's making it so that uh, two years ago, we had a summer um, of uh, about two weeks in the cities of Harriman, Riverton, South Jordan, where you couldn't irrigate your lawn. And for me also having a business where we sell sod and people put down a fresh new lawn, well, in order to put down a new lawn, you have to be able to water it consistently for two weeks for it to be established. And we had hundreds of thousands of square feet of sod that died because it didn't get that sufficient amount of water. Um, and so this is, a, this is a massive issue on a local, regional, national, and global scale that I'm very passionate about. And that is not being as wasteful with fertilizer and the way that we treat our crops and finding out better ways that we can feed them. And I think we've discovered that with nanotechnology in our products. Um, this is some information about nitrogen um, that I pulled up. Um, the problem that is that a lot of fertilizer is wasted. Um, nitrogen's fertilizer precise impact, and this was uh, 2010 claims. We're going to have better claims in 2020 and their follow-up 10-year study. 
um, is that our atmosphere, um, due to nitrous oxide, has risen by 20%. So nitrous oxide in our atmosphere has risen by 20% 20, 20 um, over the last 50 years. And researchers have determined that the steep increase in nitrous oxide since the 1960s is primarily due to nitrogen fertilizer and even more so due to the amount of nitrogen that we have to put on our corn crop, which is corn is king when it comes to agriculture. It is the biggest crop. I think we're at 370 million acres in the United States alone. Um, and this is a great, um, a great graph that was put up by Mother Jones um, with uh, the estimated sources being provided by the United States Department of Agriculture that basically shows um, the amount of tons that we put out on our crops from 1965 to 2010. And you can see that the total use is around the 12,000 mark. And um, half of that is used just to grow corn. So all of our um, dependency with our, um, with our going away from having as much fresh food is you know, our high fructose corn syrup. It's our cereals. Um, all these things that come from that are derived from corn um, a big part of this issue has been created by um, the, the global, imp uh, global warming impact and uh, in ways that we're polluting our hemisphere um, from putting down too much nitrogen. So it's, it's, a, it's a major issue that needs to be addressed. And um, what we're seeing in just in our five years of what Aquawield's been doing, there's been, um, before this wasn't even something I could talk about with farmers, I can talk to fertilizer dealers. It's now something that's open, that people are realizing it's a problem. And I think over the next 10 to 20 years, um, we're gonna have some major revolutions. And what's gonna be interesting is to see how the industry actually allows that to come into fruition. Because uh, nitrogen alone, just nitrogen alone, is about 150, um, excuse me, is about um, $90 billion of what's being put out there. Um, so it's, it's gonna be interesting to see how this um, uh, occurs, and I think all of us will be interested to um, see what happens next. Um, again, by 2050, we have to double our production of food to feed the 9.7 billion mouths, um, and this is to, to keep with that uh, global growth of the population. Um, another issue, um, so I've kind of talked about the problems of algal blooms. I've talked about the issues that we're seeing with fertilizer not going to where it needs to be or us over-fertilizing it. Another big issue that we're seeing in far farming is it's not as profitable as it used to be. Um, about two hours ago, I was talking with a wheat farmer um, up in Montana, a very large farmer. He has 40,000 acres of land. Just for him to drive to all of his fields and take care of them takes him two weeks just to take care of his whole business. He's a family-owned operation. It's him, his son, and another employee that take care of all of this land. Um, but right now, a bushel of wheat is going for under $5. Um, in comparison, prior to the Great Recession, um, he was getting a bushel of wheat between $9 and $11. So I, literally, he's, he's lost his revenue by 50% um, in over 10 years, and there's no way that he cannot put the inputs, such as the chemistry, the seed, and the fertilizer to grow it the way that, it, uh, that it's needed. And so it's a major issue that we're seeing. And so what you'll see on here, and, and this is a combination of you know, the main crops. Main crops of, of farming are corn, cotton, wheat, and soybeans. Okay? Those are the, the, the biggest ones. And the really big emerging crop is soybeans because soybean does not take as many inputs and it's easier to grow. And so we're seeing a, a bit of a shift of some corn growers being soybean growers. Okay? Um, but, but what you'll see here is that gross margins um, have slightly gone up, but gross margins universally um, by agricultural production um, industry proficiency from 2017, we're at 7.3%, and at the end of the quarter of 2018, we we're 9.79%. Um, what I'd like to talk about, though, is the main one. Um, there's, of course, gross, but the most important thing is net. You know, how much money do we actually get to put in our pocket when all is said and done? And you'll see the minimal results from 2017 at 1.21%, we're now at 3% uh, net. The way that we look at agriculture right now is I believe agriculture is, is very much so at a crossroads um, from the way that we did it, like I mentioned, from um, after World War II till now. And here's essentially what the status quo is when it comes to agriculture and the crossroads that we're at. One, um, consolidation is going to continue, and we're seeing that more conglomeration is taking place. 
Um, it used to be uh, called um, the Big Six, the Big Six Ag uh, Chemical Companies. Um, but I'm sure, as many of you know, have noticed, Syngenta is now owned by ChemChina, so they've merged. Um, Bayer from Germany now owns uh, St. Louis uh, based, um, St. Louis, Missouri based uh, Monsanto. And Dow and DuPont have now merged, um, and they now are called Corteva AgriSciences. So it used to be that we had the big six agricultural chemical companies. Now it's now the big four. Um, and that has just happened in 10 years. Okay? In addition to that, we see all these billion dollar fertilizer manufacturing companies that they're essentially what they're doing is they're going and buying up the small independent fertilizer companies because if you're not very heavily capitalized and if you can't work under these types of margins, um, it's hard to operate. And so we see these companies like Simplot, who's based out of Idaho, um, and um, uh, others uh, similar to those that are going to small um, co-ops and fertilizer uh, manufacturing companies and purchasing them and they're continuing to grow and b get a bigger footprint. And the ramifications of that is with that conglomeration is there's a huge information disadvantage to the growers. Um, there's not as much of that local touch and feel and data that's being shared with them. Um, and with, uh, with uh, a lot of these large growers, there's land and farm consolidation. Um, we're seeing um, kind of the standard is um, it used to be uh, a large commodity grower would have, you know, maybe 5,000 acres of corn and soy, and you could, you know, you could be in, in a middle class, and you could get your kid to college with that type of uh, arrangement. Now, um, due to the, the margins and issues that we've had there, um, it's now those companies are selling to the 20 to 150,000 acre large farms, um, and it's, it's taking some of that um, away from the, the local and rural communities. And with that, um, with these local farms not having as much, much support with local entrepreneurs, um, that has certainly uh, hurt the innovation that's needed to take place. Um, and that makes it so that there's now little left for these family farms. Um, family farms still are the heart of agriculture um, in the globe and, of course, in the U.S. And in the U.S. alone, um, there's 2.1 million U.S. farms, and that makes up for 99% of the, of the farms that are available um, around. Um, what we believe the right road to be um, with, uh, with this crossroads are these metrics. Um, we believe that competitions and options are better, and of course, that's the American way, the way that we look at things. Competition and options are better for the end user. Um, we believe that farming options should be independent and, of course, entrepreneurial, um, that, that there shouldn't be an information disadvantage, but that can be that data that can be advantageous to the grower. Um, we believe in thriving local economies and communities, um, specifically in the state of Utah, this has been a major issue where a lot of our rural communities are losing people to live in those homes and we have a lot of these major thriving rural communities are turning into ghost towns due to some of these issues that we see um, in farming and all, all, of course also with mining in Utah. Um, we believe that farmers should be connected and enabled by technology. Um, the, the, most, the, the biggest buzzword in, in agriculture is going to be ag tech and data and the use of, um, you know, use of drones to, to make better informed decision, and that's really exciting. Um, and we play a small piece of that, of course, with um, our technology that we're, that we're bringing to farmers. And then we believe that farms should benefit agronomically, economically, and of course, lastly, environmentally. Um, we call that, um, that, that, um, that metric the AEE, and this is um, the way that Aquia looks at it, where we go to a farm, and what, what most farmers care about um, are one, the agronomics. Are you going to be able to help my crop do better? And then secondly, um, and maybe even more importantly, as the economics, how much more am I going to yield in comparison to last year? Uh, going back to that wheat grower in Montana that I spoke with um, last year, um, if, if he just put um, a wheat seed in the ground and uh, just relied on rainfall and did a little bit of control with his herbicides and pesticides and maybe just minimal uh, fertilizer, he would get about 40 bushels to the acre. So 40 times five, 200 bucks to the acre. Um, that's, that's not too exciting for him, and he's not going to be able to be within a budget, and that's going to not make it so that he can build a legacy for his family or be able to keep up with his mortgage and the different uh, bills that we all have. Um, in order for him to get to that next level, um, he has to put down about $160 an acre, and that's going to help him get from 40 bushels an acre 
to 120, 150 bushels an acre. So as you can see and kind of think about the numbers that are being put out there, it's still very slim. So that economics needs to, um, you know, it, it needs to improve um, nation globally for, for all of us. And I think one of the ways that we'll be able to um, overcome this is I think there's going to be a large amount of government subsidies that are going to come out in the next two to five years. We're aware of some of them that are happening where we can actually showcase where we're not putting as much fertilizer and are having these types of yields and that's going to be beneficial to the farmer. And so it's not just the agronomics or just the economics. It also has to be a focus on how you're making your farm more environmentally friendly. Okay. So uh, quickly I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this last um, article. This was by um, an individual who we have a good relationship with. Her name's uh, Margie Echelkamp. She's the main editor at Ag Professional. Um, AgPro did an article in December of last year on five fertilizer trends to watch as you look towards um, 2019. Um, and, and she states uh, some things that I wanted to help everyone understand what's going on. Um, when we talk about fertilizer, the main things that we're discussing are nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium, okay? And there's also secondary nutrients and micronutrients. But when you talk to a farmer, the primary things that they are being concerned about is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Well, the issue with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is that when you put it out, only 50% of that actually gets that on the crop, okay? And that's not just people throwing those numbers out or what a, farmer's, for, uh, a farmer's been able to see. This is actual data that comes from um, Charlotte Hildebrand, who's the Director General of the International Fertilizer Association. So this is a group of international fertilizer manufacturing production companies that have said, we have an issue here. When we put out our crops, only half of it actually gets there. And that is why we see the effects of some of the things that I've, I've showcased here by us over fertilizer, um, over, over fertilizing and um, having big issues there. So with that average uptake of fertilizers being 50%, um, of course, all of that is lost in the environment. There's other things that happen, but of course, that's a, a, a big part of the issue. Um, so what Dr. Hildebrand says is that this needs to be um, an all hands on deck effort by everyone that's in agriculture um, that has their hands on fertilizer. And her takeaways are, there needs to be an ever greater emphasis on nutrient use efficiency, and that needs to become required. Um, the industry needs to meet the very specific needs of farmers. Um, sometimes I'll sit down with farmers and I'll ask them, what do you need to grow the crops to make you, you know, thrive? And they just offhand say, I need 250 pounds of nitrogen, 150 pounds of phosphorus, and 50 pounds of potassium. And the reason they say that is because that's literally what was in my grandpa's college handbook on agriculture of what was needed to grow their crops. Well, I think we can all agree technology has drastically changed, and that is not the place. And so we need to, as an industry, educate the end user, the farmer, the crop consultants, of the better way to go about that. And that will help with some of this excess um, uh, uh, of usage. Um, we also need to see that regulatory frameworks need to be tightened up. Again, I talked about earlier the environment and the government subsidies um, need to take place so that we can make it so that our crops are going to be um, more environmental and uh, we can continue to grow the plants and crops that we love for many more years to come. Um, there needs to be a wide array of technologically enhanced plant nutrition solutions and services. Um, we do a great job with uh, showcasing uh, moisture and showcasing um, when it's the best time to actually, um, you know, go out and work in our fields because it's not muddy or what have you. There isn't great sensors and technology that's available to farmers that, sh that says, right now in the rhizosphere of your crop, you're depleted in phosphorus. Right now would be a good time to go out and put out that, that phosphorus. So I think that's a huge opportunity for us. Um, and I think, I, I'm sure a lot of you are involved in, um, you know, the, the sensors that we need to tell people when we can actually go and water our crops or when it's the ideal time. If we can combine that with the right time to actually feed our crops with fertilizer, that's going to be a game changer for this industry. Just an idea. Um, and there's an increasing demand, of course, up w with what I just said. Measurable technologically enhanced indicators. And then lastly, traceability. Um, these issues with, um, with Sally Homeowner, she wants to know if there was Roundup or glyphosate put on her food. This organic movement, it's, it's continuing to thrive and it's not going away. And there's going to be even tougher scrutiny 
on farmers that grow crops for them to show the traceability of every type of fertilizer that's being put out on their crops. Um, other things that are important to people, um, organic farmers in Yuma, Arizona, um, I think they're very similar to a lot of the issues that you have in Pakistan where water is being depleted. A lot of that water has been eutrophied or been polluted and so the access to actually grow these crops is becoming slimmer. And so they're now working, uh, looking at instead of how much water do we have the next year, how much water do we have in the next five to ten years? And how much of that water is going to be allotted for specific crops? Because the amount of water that a watermelon crop needs in a spinach crop and a kale crop drastically varies. And so that's going to be really interesting to see how that all changes. And Aukwield, it's really fun for me because I'm so passionate about agriculture. Um, it's fun to be next to these people that are making these great decisions. Um, I, I, the, the thing I, if I could say anything is farmers in general, all farmers, they are stewards of the land. They want their land to not be polluted. They want to make the best decisions that they can to continue to grow the crops um, that they you know, need to grow to you know, pay, pay their bills. Um, that is not specifically the issue. The issue comes from a lot of these, as I mentioned, um, large conglomerates and corporations who tell uh, farmers that they need to put out, again, 250 pounds of nitrogen, 150 pounds of phosphorus, 50 pounds of potassium, when in reality, most likely about half of that is what is actually needed. Um, but there's an issue with um, you know, heating your quarterly reports and uh, you know, feeding your shareholders um, the, the profits that they need versus what's best for the farmer. And that is the crux of what we're seeing in agriculture and where a lot of what things like Aukwield and other great uh, sustainable input companies are going to be making major inroads in the next 10 years. Okay. Um, so I haven't even talked about Aukwield yet. I, I've spent most of the time talking about the issues that we're seeing in the industri uh, industry. I've gone, how are we on time? We're here, so I've got about 20 minutes, so good. So hopefully everyone has seen my passion, has seen where the issues are, and you know, if I can do anything, if I can just get you know, one person that has some slight interest in this and wants to do something with it, that's a win for me and why I do this. Um, so Aukwield, who are we? I talked to you guys about you know, our collaboration with the U. Um, Aukwield, who we are, is we're an award-winning biotechnology company. What we do is we take sophisticated nanoparticles, I'll describe what nano is in a moment, um, and we add those to liquid agricultural products, and we make it so that they're more effective at plant absorption. Okay? That's what we do. We are the most efficient delivery system in liquid agricultural products. That's who we are, and that's our place. Okay? Um, we're a grower initiative, so unlike most fertilizer or chemistry companies, they're not owned by farmers. Um, more than 60% of the shareholders of Aukwield uh, come from a farming background or own a farm like myself. And so that makes it really fun that we don't just think short term with what we're doing. We have a long term game in mind. Um, and that, of course, is helping farmers the best way that we can. Okay, so why Aukwield? Our products improve fertilizer efficiency by higher yields. So if you put this out on your crop, you're going to actually be able to grow more. And you can do that with less money. That's a win-win, right? Well, that is important to growers, but there is a bit of a slow initiative for them to see this. Um, again, that Montana wheat grower is talking about uh, just recently where we were talking about the economics of how we're going to improve with him. He has 40,000 acres. He put us on 2,000 acres last year, and he saw an increase in yield by 30%. Most people, if they had that happen to them, they're going to say, well, dang, Willie, I'm going to put this on all 40,000 acres now. Farmers have been, um, have been um, taken advantage of so many times, and they've had so many mishaps with chemicals that they've then put out the next year that didn't perform the same way. Generally, you have about a three to five entry period. So even though we have this win-win, it's a very slow sell cycle for us to have our technology there. And so I think with a lot of the water initiatives um, and, and things that this group will be involved in, I think we need to be mindful that this isn't something we can just plug into a farm and they're going to see results that year. They will probably see those results, but in order for them to fully adopt it, it's going to take about three to five years. Lastly, um, due to the higher yields, less money spent, we also have a lot less waste. In some instances, we can uh, go to a farm and reduce their fertilizer usage by 80%, 90%. Um, so, I mean, that's just fantastic for the environment and, of course, for them economically. 
And what that does is it makes it so that farms are more environmentally friendly. And that's why we are winning environmental science awards and are being showcased in some of these communities where we're making major inroads. The okay? um, reason we started the company is um, myself, my father, when we were involved in looking at our fertilizer program at Biograss, we didn't believe the status quo was good enough. We knew there was a better way to go about it. And by incorporating the nanotechnology into our fertilizing and uh, chemical program, um, it's made huge dividends for us. And I'll, I'll showcase um, shortly um, our initial trials and the success that we had. Um, we believe that we are part of the uh, fertilizer of the future. And um, you know our goal is to be on every acre or hectare in the globe. Okay? So not all of our products, but one of our products we believe can help every hectare or acre across the world. And uh, that's, that's a pretty big thing to bite on and, and, and try to chew on. But we believe that we're in the early stages where we can get there. So briefly, our timeline, I'll go through quickly because we um, I spent so much time talking about the issues with agriculture. 2014-2015, um, um, we after our success of what took place at our sod farm, um, we went into the early phases of science and business development of Aquield. Um, the company launched and target, targeted sod growers, just like myself, because we know uh, almost every major sod grower throughout the United States. And then what we did is, as we were doing that, we came into Florida, and we found a unique niche in citrus production. The issues with citrus production currently is they have a pest called Huang, Huang Long Bing, um, which has made it so the metabolism of trees that they can't get the nutrients that they need to. So if you ever hear about a term called citrus greening or orange greening, what that means is the metabolism system in these trees, whether it's a brand two-year-old tree or if it's a 40-year-old uh, citrus tree, is unable to actually metabolize the fruit um, that it needs to grow. And the orange will actually turn green and, and, and won't turn orange, so they can't actually grow it. It's because of the fertilizer issue. Well, with Aquield's nanotechnology, we're able to get into that met metabolism system and actually help them grow more fruit. And I'll, I'll showcase some data on that. Um, 2016, we were awarded our first utility patent, um, which basically goes through our delivery system and the way that we prepare nanoparticles. We have a lot more patents past that. 2017, we came out of what we called our stealth mode, which uh, initially was we were not just going to work directly with growers. We were going to go to mu many more dealers, be showcased by the media, and start um, you know, trying to win awards and, and be recognized. And of course, that has done very well for us as we came out of stealth mode. To 2018 and 2019, um, we unveiled our nano product line. Um, our initial way that we made our, our uh, technology work for farmers is we had to have a mobile laboratory drive to their farm, we would purify their water, add nanoparticles to that purified water, add that fertilizer, and leave them with 250 gallons of product. And in that 250 gallons of product, generally you would only have about two and a half to five gallons of actual fertilizer. So that was very compelling for them. But logistically, going through all the con continental United States and also uh, past, uh, past that internationally, you can't put all these mobile labs that cost a, a half a million dollars everywhere. And so we were able to figure out how we could get all of our products in a two and a half gallon jug. And in this two and a half gallon jug, it can feed 80 acres or 160 uh, hectares. So very exciting. Um, and that's where our huge growth has come is, is due to us going to that nano product line. Um, now we're in 47 states. Um, additional cells uh, all, all over the globe, and that's where I believe a lot of our growth is going to come, um, just mainly due to um, where the main places are, are being made fertilizer, Brazil, China, India, and the U.S. Um, it's really expensive and hard to ship water containers, and there's also a lot of shrinkage and issues when you go over the seas. Um, we literally, when we ship material, we have to sign a waiver that says if this container of your fertilizer falls off the boat, there's no ramifications for that. There's no insurance that covers that, right? This is, this is difficult. Where we have a, a great opportunity with international expansion is to be able to go to countries like Pakistan or companies like Japan or the, South, the big South America push that we're involved in right now. And we can literally put on a pallet 180 gallons that can do 5,200 acres um, instead of them needing to have, um, let's see, that would be uh, 2,000 gallons of, of fertilizer. We can do that with 180 gallons. So that's really the big premise for us is what we do in the supply chain. And then lastly, um, the way that we can uh, have that be so much more effective in absorption. So that's our quick timeline. Um, some notable customers for us are going to be companies like Del Monte, 
Dole, Zenno Hague, Duda, um, a lot of these major companies, they're taking note of what we're doing and they're interested in it, okay? Um, our IP portfolio, um, one published utility patent in multiple countries. I think it's 57 with all said and done. Um, we have a recent granted utility patent that covers the NanoShield delivery system. And then we have a, a number of additional patents that are pending, such as the, um, the nanoparticle that we developed here with the University of Utah um, that is being licensed to us by the University of Utah developed and we help them put together um, to other great um, potential no drift um, uh, chemi chemistries that are going to have major benefits that individuals like Kyle Isaacson are working on that we will uh, eventually have into a patent portfolio. Um, five international trademarks, and this is outdated. It only says 20 plus trademarks. It's, it's something like 30 now or so. Um, our product pricing, this is also the key, is we have a great product. Um, it, it can be shipped very efficiently. It works, but it has to be something that is actually affordable, right? As I talked about, Farmers, in general, have pretty thin margins. If you're growing wheat or if you're growing pecans, which is a, a much higher and, and there's a lot more money can be made per acre, you have to have something that is going to make sure that works with our budget. And our products cost between $2.50 an acre to $6.25 an acre. Um, my board gives me a hard time because they want to increase our prices. They think that it's better um, if we start to do that now. But I still believe that we, with our products, um, we need to be patient and have it much more affordable before we keep developing new technologies and improving them. And so I think that's a key component of commercializing, um, you know, water entrepreneurship and commercializing technology for sustainable inputs is even though it might be very expensive to um, get that technology to be in production, um, you, you need to make sure that you don't start out the gate having a product that costs $40 an acre. Um, it needs to be something that is uh, much more affordable for that grower and then they'll actually take a chance on you. And then if you can, over three to five years, have something that can be successful for them, then you will be um, you know, the, the standard way and the status quo of how they feed their crops. And that's been our, our vision with that. So how, how is the nano scale? I've spent a lot of time on uh, saying what nano is. Um, essentially, this is uh, the, the range of sizes of what we discuss with nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is defined as one to 100 nanometers, okay? So nano, uh, at that size, that's completely naked to the human eye, okay? Um, the way I like to describe it to people, if you type a period on your computer screen, um, it would be 100 times smaller than that period at a 12-point font. So you can't even see it, right? It takes very sophisticated um, microscopy, microscopy to showcase this, and I'll show you some images here shortly. Um, and this is kind of a scale of how we describe it, with the calcium ion being 0.1 nanometers and the aqua nanoparticle being 100 nanometers, okay? Um, why nano delivery is important for agriculture um, is, of course, it's affordable, it's safe, environmentally friendly. Um, a huge, uh, huge impact that we have is it's very stable. Um, we can make a fertilizer and extend its shelf life, um, sometimes in years, in comparison to some of the other ways that are being made. So literally a farmer could buy a surplus of what we need if he has a good year for his budget and he can actually use that product the next year. Oftentimes with fertilizer you aren't able to do that, but due to the use of our nanoparticles we can, so it's very exciting. And of course it's broadly effective. It works on corn, citrus, canola, and cotton. You know, it, wor it works everywhere on every type of uh, crop that's being grown. Um, considerations that you need to have when you're using nanotechnology and delivery um, is different nanoparticles move differently through different soil types. And that's why we have a swath and array of our intellectual property of different types of nanoparticles because they need to work differently in different soil types. Also, um, it needs to work differently through different leaves. So the way that a farmer fertilizes his crop is they talk about foliar, so that's water that you put on the leaf of the plant, or root applied, which is um, you apply it specifically just on the soil. And there's different ways that nanoparticles and specific chemistries uh, interact with them. And so that has given us a huge um, understanding and, and basis for us to have, um, you know, be front rotors in comparison to others because we understand these different soil types and crops. And of course, um, nanoparticle size can greatly affect the nanoparticle fate. If it's too small, it's not going to actually get to uh, the cell wall where we need it to be. If it's the right size, it will. And I'll, I'll showcase some slides here shortly on that. So um, I, I won't go on that. The, what we call our technology um, and the way that people use it is 
nanotechnology, we can't describe, describe it just as that because um, ever since the iPod Nano, right, in, in the early 2000s, people have been using this buzzword, nano. So we came up with the trademark being nano shield. And what it is is we create a nano sized shield around nutrient molecules. So imagine that we take a phosphorus ion, and what we do with that phosphorus ion, which is you know 0.1 nanometers, is we then encapsulate it with uh, nanoparticles that range in size from 50 to 100 nanometers. And thus, that makes it so it's much more delivered with that nano shield component to get to where it needs to be. And that's why we call it the nano shield. Um, here are some images of what you can see. A lot of these were taken um, not too far from here um, at the U-Star building. Uh, not too far from where, where Kyle works with the Nano Institute of Utah. Um, our main way that we view our nanoparticles is called the transmission electron microscope. Um, I'm not smart enough to tell you all the ways of how that uh, you know, takes the pictures it is. Kyle, good, so maybe we can ask him afterwards how it specifically works. Essentially, a laser is, is shot through and, and different images are taken so that we can get down to that scale. But this is, um, if you ever hear the buzzword about nanotechnology or we have nanoparticles, the thing you'll want to know is, do you actually have images of that specific nanoparticle that I can see? If you're not able to see that from someone, I would probably turn the other way. Um, we have very, uh, very sophisticated ways that we track all of our products. Um, you know, we're trying to get to ISO 9001 standardization in time, and that's why we take images of every t kind of uh, uh, product that we make and, uh, and also track it um, in our laboratory to make sure that if there is an issue, we can go back to that sample and say, hey, that wasn't the right size, and that's why it didn't work for that soil. Okay? These are some graphs, um, and I won't spend too much time on them because they're on our YouTube and our, and our website where we basically showcase the different um, things that we need to break through on a foliar or root level and how the nanoparticles deliver those specific chemistries. Um, the, we've had a lot of pushback from the industry because we're basically saying it's a lot different from what were these textbooks um, you know, in the, in the er, uh, late 1940s, early 1950s. And so for us to be able to sit down at a kitchen table with a farmer and go through all of this, all that time has uh, helped us commercialize this technology. Um, so we, we literally are pioneering what we call nano, nanogronomy. Um, and um, we're, we're very proud of that, how we've been able to come to all these different farms and showcase how nanotechnology can benefit them. Um, I'm going to jump ahead and I'll just show a few different slides of uh, some of the results that we've had and then we, we can end with a couple minutes of Q&A because I think I took a little bit too long on some other things which I apologize. Um, 2013, this is where we discovered how nanotechnology can work in agriculture. What we had is two, we had two 33 acre plots. You'll see one's in standard, one says optimized. Um, the language we use is different, but I still like to use this because it kind of shows our foundation where we came from. Um, below that, you can see the images of what it looked like in June of the following year. So these were, photos were taken in September of 2012. Below, you can see of what it looked like in uh, June of 2013. This field um, received our standard way that we go about it, about 250 gallons of a product called 9243. This to the right, which had nanoparticles infused with that fertilizer, only had 25 gallons of uh, 9243 in comparison to the 250 gallons. Okay, so that was very exciting. Um, in addition to it looking better and us using less fertilizer, um, we were able to grow it um, much faster, four months. This wasn't available to be harvested till October, November. And so us in Utah, where we have about an eight to nine month growing season, we can trim that back and we can get our product to um, a home or into an institution like the University of Utah. Very exciting. So that's when the light bulb went off. Um, I'll go through uh, some things that we saw in citrus, and then I'll do the last study that we had with uh, Utah State University. You'll see over here that the total average boxes per acre. So when they look at citrus in production, it's how many trees you have and how much of those trees can get. We can take that fruit and put it into a box. And so they look at boxes per acre, BPA. You'll see in 2013, they were at 428 boxes per acre in a short period of time, um, almost cut in half at 260 boxes per acre. They started using the Aquiled program and they bumped up by 36% in one year. Okay? So thus, these issues that they've had with greening and us being able to get into that uh, metabolism system much better has helped um, us. It, it made it so that now Florida um, citrus is uh, a major part of our revenue source. Okay, let me jump ahead here real quick. Um, this is with um, an internationally known fresh farm um, that I'm sure many of you have uh, 
their, uh, their food in your pantry currently. Um, you can see that their, their typical program, they would put out 14 gallons of phosphoric acid. Um, they went through the Aquawield program and only put out four gallons to the acre. And that led to an, in, an increase in yield by 35% on their cantaloupes, um, and then an increase on their honeydews by 65%. And what's, uh, what's really exciting is we can continue as we put out our products throughout the season to soil test and analyze what's taking place. And this is when the grower got really excited when um, he was able to see that on the Aquawield program, he had 4,300 to 4,800 parts per million of phosphorus in that crop versus his standard, which had you know, 14 gallons at 3,300, 3,100 parts per million. So we're putting out a lot less and it's getting into that plant um, and absorbing much more effectively. Okay, I'll, um, I'll just uh, end with these two last things that are on glyphosate and then we'll have some questions, of course. Um, glyphosate is, uh, the after nitrogen, it's the most widely used uh, chemical on a farm. Um, its brand name before it became off patent was, of course, Roundup. Um, Roundup is uh, really being uh, demonized and having a lot of issues. If any of us uh, purchase things at Costco, like my family, you go there every two weeks, you now no longer can buy Roundup at Costco um, because of the issues that we're seeing with it. But um, you can see that we cut um, our rates of uh, glyphosate with our product called NanoPro um, by, by 40%. And we had had a 26% higher amount of glyphosate in that crop. And it's evident by, you can see how much more sparser this weed is in the glyphosate plus nanopro versus their standard program. And we continue to see other um, results like that uh, throughout. Um, this was taken, that, that one was in Texas, and here's one that's taken in Maryland. Um, so I, I guess in closing, I just want to say, um, if, if, if you have the grit and the tenacity and the excitement and the passion, to get involved in uh, sustainable inputs and change in the world, um, there is a place for it. You have, of course have to have the right pricing, the right messaging, the right research and development to get there, but it's a huge need um, for our earth. Um, I consider myself um, a social entrepreneur because um, what I'm being involved in commercializing is going to be the good for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, and that's what drives me. Um, I, could, I, I, I could probably be making double or triple income in comparison to uh, what I'm doing right now, doing something else. Um, but to me, that's not as important as having a major effect on the earth, and um, I'm very excited about that.